Buongiorno a tutti e benvenuti all'incontro con Welcome, welcome to this meeting with Professor um, Paul Seabright. Mr. Franceschini, that lives in London, but it was here during the festival, was telling me uh, that um, it looked almost incredible to him to be in Italy, and someone retorted that we are not in Italy, we are in the region of Trentino. But since we are uh, in Trentino and in Italy at the same time, I thought that we should uh, start at one minute past 12. Uh, Professor Seabright is an economist, but apart from uh, his uh, specialist activity, he is uh, very famous for a book he published in 2005 uh, called The Company of Strangers. I deliberately uh, give you this uh, name in English, and I'm doing so because although it was immediately translated into Italian, I don't think it is available in bookshops now. At least uh, I tried to find it on the web, but I could not find the Italian edition. But the second reason why the English version is uh, more easily available is that it was reprinted again uh, just a few weeks ago by uh, the Princeton University Press in a revised edition. So there is a brand new uh, version. In addition to uh, making some specific uh, considerations on uh, monetary uh, economics, there's also one more chapter, chapter eight, uh, which refers to the 2008-2009 economic and financial crisis. The purpose of this book is to provide an answer to uh, a very simple and key question that is uh, at the basis of our economic life there's a, a very simple uh, type of exchange there's a, a relationship between it, uh, and among individuals and it's curious to think that uh, over all its history mankind has used this type of uh, exchange instead of uh, using other uh, pulsions that we have, like diffidence or violence. So why did we privilege this type of relationship between and among individuals, which then made all uh, economic life possible, is actually the question that attracted the attention of uh, Paul Seabright. And uh, his book is trying to provide an answer to this question, his book which is really fascinating. To find an answer to this question, Paul Seabright goes far beyond the borders of economic science, uh, calling into question a number of other areas from paleontology to neurosciences, which uh, is, will also refer to uh, today, as well as sociology, history, and so on. So it is in no way a specialist text. Uh, it's a kind of neo-humanistic attempt to venture into areas uh, which are beyond one's own uh, specialty in an attempt to draw information from all possible areas of knowledge. So it's a kind of intellectual journey uh, and I just started reading this uh, new edition, which uh, has been in the bookshops just uh, in the past two weeks or so. As all journeys, uh, it requires quite a lot of courage, uh, intellectually, if not physically, and I would say even emotionally. Uh, it is quite difficult from all these standpoints to challenge all the knowledge you have uh, in an attempt to look for something new. The same type of approach will be followed by Professor Seabright today uh, during his lecture. I've been here for a couple of days uh, and I've followed many interesting presentations, but I believe that today's uh, topic selected by uh, Professor Seabright uh, has a strong resonance with all the matters that have been discussed 
in the past 48 hours or so. I'm thinking in particular of uh, Alexander Steele and John Kampfner's uh, lecture at Palazzo Jeremia uh, that spoke uh, at length about the uh, excess of information uh, from, uh, that surrounds us in our times. And there were also a number of interesting discussions on the role of Google, which in a way governs uh, this huge amount of information. And there was also another presentation that I found very interesting yesterday, a uh, presentation uh, by the Bhutan Prime Minister, who talked about how to grow and how to develop in a framework of increasingly limited resources. And I was particularly surprised to see that this was uh, a statement made by uh, people from uh, a developing country uh, where people don't really like the idea that they cannot develop too much. Uh, and on the contrary, we saw that there are people who are aware of that. Whenever we talk about uh, digital world, we may run the risk of uh, believing that uh, development can be endless. We add bytes, gigabytes, terabyte to the internet uh, virtual world is often taken as a new path to development, uh, which unlike the material uh, growth, the material, the wealth development, in the, uh, which is uh, occurred in the past century is virtually limitless. But I believe Paul Seabright will uh, let us uh, understand that even that kind of de development has some intrinsic limitations and there's a scarcity of resources. But I don't want to take more of your time and I'll give the floor uh, to Paul Seabright. Let me just uh, make just one final uh, point. Um, you found the Italian translation of uh, Professor Seabright um, presentation, uh, his slides, his PowerPoint, and um, he added a few uh, changes so there are two or three of the images that he's going to show that are not uh, among those that have been translated, but I don't think that's really uh, a problem. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pietro, for this wonderfully generous introduction. It is a fantastic privilege for me to be speaking in this extraordinary festival, which I have been amazed by and delighted by. And to speak in this place, in this room, is an extraordinary privilege. I'm also aware of a heavy burden of responsibility, symbolically speaking, because in this city which is emblematic of the Counter-Reformation, I'm speaking at an hour when all good Catholics should be in church, and I hope very much to be worthy of my claim on your attention. I would like to start by asking you in the audience a question, and please answer, and you may answer in Italian, and answer quickly. What's happening in this picture? Somebody tell me. da parte del pubblico richiesta sta accadendo an exchange yes i think that's right any anybody else want to say more about it a discussion maybe yes i think it's probably a market it's somewhere in africa now who is buying and who is selling The child is selling. Okay, I think you're probably right. Who, who is buying? The women are buying. Right, how do you know that? By, by their face. What is it about their face? The, their they're waiting, you say? Worried. worried. Okay, they're worried. Maybe. Anybody, any other suggestions as to how do you know? Can I point out something that 
it's very unusual for children to sell things. You live in a country where I think it's illegal mostly for children to sell, but you immediately guessed that the child was selling. I think you're right. But what is it about the child that tells you he's selling? Exactly. Exactly. The reason you know the boy is selling is because he's not looking at the goods. The women are looking at the goods, and so you can work out from this that the boy already knows what the goods are, so he is the seller. Now, I may be right, I may be wrong, but I want to point out to you that you have just performed an amazing act of mental inference. You have immediately worked out who is selling in this market. Even though it's very unusual in your experience to see children selling, and you did so so fast that you could not tell me immediately how you made this calculation. And this picture is an example for me of the fact that our brains have an astonishing capacity to process information about our social relationships and to draw economic inferences from this information. In other words, we can understand the social and economic relationships in a situation so fast that we cannot explain immediately how we have reached these conclusions. So that's the first picture I want to show you. Now I'd like to show you a second picture. This man is called G.P. Sawant. And according to the New York Times, who wrote his profile in 2007, he lives in Mumbai in India and he is a professional letter writer. I encourage you to go and see the article because his story is rather touching. He writes letters uh, for people who cannot write letters for themselves. He writes letters to the government. He writes letters to somebody's boss to ask for a pay rise. He writes letters to, uh, for people who are in love. And most charming of all, he writes letters without a fee for the many prostitutes who come to Mumbai from the countryside. They arrive at the main train station in Mumbai and they go to do this uh, dangerous and difficult and unpleasant work. And they have to tell their families at home in the villages what they're doing. And they don't want to tell their families that they are prostitutes. So this man, who is a sort of poet of the urban life, writes letters to their families on their behalf, explaining some invented story about their job and maybe about their nice friends and about the pleasant place where they live. And the families believe this and the families are happy and the girl's honor is for some time at least safe. Now, the New York Times tells us that this man's livelihood is disappearing. And the reason why it's disappearing, according to the New York Times, is that the mobile telephone is replacing letters. Nobody writes letters anymore, so they all send texts to their families. And if they send texts, his job is disappearing. Now, when I read this story, I was surprised because I remembered having read a wonderful book uh, that was published in 1851 in London called London Labour and the London Poor by a, a remarkable man called Henry Mayhew. And in this letter, he, in this uh, book, he describes the many kinds of jobs that people do in a big 19th century city like London including the people who sweep up the garbage and uh, the people who sell. And one job which doesn't exist today, which is the job he calls screevers or writers of begging letters and petitions. And in 19th century London, like I suspect in 19th century Italy, there were many, many professional letter writers. And their livelihood disappeared many, many decades before the mobile telephone. What made their livelihood disappear was not the mobile telephone. It was the fact of universal literacy. 
when everybody can write their own letters, they don't need a professional letter writer. So, why am I telling you this story? Well, it's common to hear people say that information and communications technology has wonderful potential for the world economy, and I believe that. And everything I say today is going to be consistent with my faith in information and, consume, and communications technology. But people sometimes say, well, if you look at how it has changed the lives of people who have trained in computer programming in India, you see the huge potential for the rest of the country. And that's where I want to warn us not to be too optimistic. Because many of the benefits which information and communications technology brings to computer programmers in Bangalore, for example, are benefits like the benefit from being the only letter writer in your village. They are benefits which will only last so long as other people do not acquire the same skill. Now, I want to explain this argument to you, and I'm going to do so by arguing that information and communications technology works by bringing people together, by matching people. And the ability of this technology to match people together is going to be limited by the shortage of what I think is the most scarce resource in the world, and that is the resource that you have between your ears. Your brain, and specifically, the ability of your brain to pay attention. And it may be, as I'll describe to you in, in a few moments, that the faith that we have that the ability to write a computer program, for example, may bring great hope to the world's poor, will come up against the shortage of people's attention, and we will find that the ability to write a website or to have a fantastic Facebook page, which five years ago might have given you a uh, source of income, will no longer be a source of income. So, what am I going to cover? The first thing is just to tell you one or two facts about what ICT, Information and Communication Technology, are actually doing in poor countries. Then I want to talk about how it works to match people together, and I want to distinguish two kinds of problems which are solved by the matching technology. The first problem is what we call a coordination problem. So a coordination problem is what happens if two drivers in cars are coming down the road towards each other, and they have to decide which side of the road they drive on. And as you know, each country has its own rules. So the country where I was born, the United Kingdom, you drive on the left, in Italy, you drive on the right, and many years ago when Nigeria made the change, the Minister of uh, Transport announced publicly that the change would be made gradually. I think he meant that the preparations would be gradual, not that the moment of the change would be gradual. Then I want to uh, tell you a little bit about three important findings in neuropsychology, which tell us what exactly are the limits on the ability of our brain to process attention. And then I'm going to ask the question about what does that mean in the long run for the world and its development. So let's start with the good news. Okay, these are two people in Africa using mobile telephones. And it is truly wonderful if you travel in Africa, as I have done, in places where the roads are almost non-existent and you can see people, many very poor people, have either telephones of their own or the ability to buy telephone time by the second from somebody else who does. So here are a few numbers. Africa has now nearly 350 million mobile phone subscribers. That's a lot of people. India has 433 million. China, 506. There are nearly 5 billion subscriptions in the world. Okay? Now, 5 billion is a big number. 
you probably can't imagine how big 5 billion is. I like to think that 5 billion is the number of days that it would take your hair to grow from here to Morocco. Okay? It's a lot of days. And it's a lot of people. Now, what are these people doing with their mobile te telephones? They're not just chatting to each other. They're doing many important and life-saving things. So, they are using mobile banking. They are transferring money to each other with an SMS text message. They're consulting the doctor. If you see, as I have seen, families whose children die because they cannot afford to take them to the doctor and die because they cannot afford to ask anybody what has to be done to save the child's life, then you can imagine what a wonderful lifesaver a mobile telephone can be. The internet, there are not so many subscribers, there are less than 100 million in China, only 8 million in India, but of course each subscription is used by many, many people. So over 400 million internet users in China, nearly 100 million in India, and nearly 2 billion in the world. And the benefits are extraordinary. I've mentioned benefits for health, benefits for trade. Uh, in Africa, many traders who might wish to uh, engage in an exchange with a partner don't know if the partner is going to show up at the day when they promised and at the place where they promised. But if they know that they have the partner's mobile phone number, they're willing to take the risk of going with their goods and making the economic exchange. So trade is helped by these communications. Similarly, education is being transformed. I would encourage you to go and visit on YouTube a series of uh, films made by the Khan Academy. And the Khan Academy has been started by a, a, a person who used to run a hedge fund in California and who uh, makes videos in which he explains how to do algebra and calculus and uh, chemistry in terms that people all across the world can understand. India now has two million trained computer professionals and they are transforming the economy around them both for themselves and their families and for the society in which they live. So this is all the good news and nothing I say next is going to take away from this good news. But let me remind you, what does ICT do? It matches people together. And the matching, as I said, falls into two categories. Think of coordination problems. How do you find somebody who wants to find you? So maybe you and your friend are going to meet in the center of Trento. Where do you meet? Maybe there are several different places. Maybe you could meet at the train station. Maybe you could meet at the Duomo. Maybe you could meet at your favorite cafe. What does the telephone do? It helps you to coordinate. You're both happy. And this works often when you meet strangers as well as friends. So if you want to take some simple examples, in the United States, more than in Europe, people put bumper stickers on their cars to say something about who they are. So if you are an Obama supporter at the last election, you would put an Obama bumper sticker, and this would help to put you in touch with other Obama supporters. If you were a McCain supporter, you would be uh, signaling your presence to other McCain supporters. Nobody would cheat. Why should you cheat? If you're an Obama supporter, you don't want to meet McCain supporters. If you're a McCain supporter, you don't want to meet Obama supporters. So it's naturally honest. And some kinds of economic service are naturally honest, too. A taxi service, for example. You call uh, a taxi, and they send a taxi to you. Why would the taxi want to come? Why would you want to tell the taxi the wrong place? Why would the taxi want to advertise its number saying it's available when it isn't available? So the communication is about coordination. Nobody has an incentive to cheat. 
But now, think about other kinds of communication. I want to sell you a product. I want to tell you that my product is the best product. How do you know I'm telling the truth? Everybody wants to claim that their product is the best product. And the trouble with the communications revolution is that it allows the producer of the best product to tell you that. And it also allows very cheaply the producers of all the other products to pretend that they are the producer of the best product. So when honesty is a problem, communications technology makes life easier for the honest people and for the cheats. And that becomes very difficult. In order to sort out the honest people from the cheats, you have to see what is a credible claim. And credibility is really at the heart of what communication has to be about. So let me give you some examples. In the 19th century, uh, particularly in the United States, many people would sell patent medicines. And patent medicines pretended to be the cure to every problem you could imagine. But many patent medicines were very dangerous. And advertising and regulation both arose as a way of trying to separate the credible from the fake claims. Let me give you another interesting example about selling cars. You may have seen this person, and you may have seen that car. When Citroën launched that car a few years ago, they asked the supermodel Claudia Schiffer to advertise it for them. Now, when I first looked at this, I was a bit surprised. I thought, what does she know about cars? Would I trust her belief about engineering? Then the second thing I thought was, I bet she drives a Porsche anyway. But then I realized, why did the manufacturers of the car want to pay such a large amount of money to hire her? Because the one thing we all know about her is that she earns a lot of money, a seriously large amount of money. So she's very expensive. And I thought, why should they pay that? And then I realized, that's the whole point. If you are manufacturing a car, a new car, and nobody really knows if your car is going to be a success or not, the fact that you can afford to pay for a Claudia Schiffer advertisement campaign means that you must be very confident about the quality of your car. And that is why this advertisement is credible. Because you do something expensive and maybe wasteful because only the producer of the good product could afford to do something so very costly. I'll give you another example which uh, comes from a very nice book by Jeffrey Miller called Spent. He's an anthropologist and he observes our behavior with much good humor. He says, why do some people own rare breeds of pet animals? Because rare breeds are very delicate. They take a lot of looking after. And they have very delicate health and they take a lot of your time. And his answer is that the time and effort in looking after a rare breed of pet is the whole point. Because it signals to other people that you are the kind of person who is very conscientious. You take time and you take trouble. And you can be trusted because you won't let somebody down when they need care. And if you want to test that theory, the best way to test it is that if you see a single woman walking in a park and you see that she's willing to say hello to a single man that she's never met before, it's likely that that will be because both of them are walking a dog. It's the safest way to meet unattached people who are reliable. Because if the dog takes a lot of looking after, then you know that these people are probably to be trusted. Let me give you an example of advertising in nature. Um, this is an example from an insect. We know that in most natural species, 
the males compete heavily for access to the females because the female eggs are scarce, but the males produce lots of sperm and the males can fertilize many females. But I'm going to show you a very interesting exception to this rule. It's an insect called the dance fly. And these insects mate because the females gather together in large sort of uh, insect discotheques called leks. And the males come to the swarming females. And they bear presents. And the presents are little uh, uh, animals that they've killed, little arthropods that they've killed and they offer them as food to the females. Now, the females really value this food. It really improves their chances of successfully bearing young. So when a male with a big chunk of food arrives, the females go wild and they compete. And how do they compete? They have evolved sacs full of air on their abdomen. I'm going to show you. This is a male dance fly. And you see it has a, quite a, a slim abdomen. But this is a female. And if you contrast it, you will see that the female has this sack of air. And she can blow it up with air to make herself look very fertile. It's the same principle as silicone breast enhancement, except that it's a lot cheaper. And the important thing is that it works at least, I don't know about the silicon breast enhancement, but the insect uh, enhancement works because the females with the larger abdomens are genuinely more fertile, even if they are also exaggerating how fertile they are. So, in other words, the advertisement is an exaggeration, but it's not completely wrong. And you may draw uh, whatever conclusions you like for human advertisements as well. Now, I've been explaining to you matching and how matching solves the problem of finding somebody who has an incentive to exaggerate the benefits that they can offer you. Now, I said to you that when matching solves a coordination problem, like where to find a taxi, then everybody is really better off. Everybody gets to meet a person who wanted to meet them. But when matching is about credible signaling, it's not so good. Because for every dance fly, every male dance fly who gets the desirable females, there are some male dance flies who don't get them. So for every producer of good quality products, there is some other producer of not so good quality products who doesn't get the customers. As signaling becomes cheaper and easier, everybody invests more. They all invest more in advertising, in signaling, in communication. And it's good for them because it helps them to stand out from the crowd, but it can't be good for everybody because not everybody can be best. And if it's important to you to persuade others that you are the best, then not everybody can win. And that's the problem which information technology is going to come up against, that there is a scarcity of attention which can be lavished on the best. Each of us hopes that we can be the best, and the technology cannot make us all the best. It can even sometimes make it worse. And I'm going to read to you a little paragraph here from a, a book uh, called The Winner Takes All Society, which is about opera singers. Winner takes all markets, that is to say markets where the people who are the best get a large amount of the business, have proliferated in part because technology has greatly increased the power and reach of the planet's most gifted performers. At the turn of the 19th to 20th centuries, the state of Iowa in the United States alone had more than 1,300 opera houses. And thousands of tenor singers earned adequate, if modest, livings performing before live audiences. Now that most music we listen to is pre-recorded, the world's best tenor 
can be literally everywhere at once. It costs no more to stamp out CDs from Pavarotti's master recording than from some less well-known tenor. Millions of us are willing to pay a little bit extra to hear him than the other singers, and this explains why Pavarotti earns millions of dollars per year, as most other tenors who are nearly as talented as him struggle to make a living at all. So, we have seen this not just with opera singers, we've seen it with footballers, we've seen it with actors and musicians, we've seen it with authors. Now, technology makes it easy for us to do things like publish our own books, you can produce your own books, you can produce your own movies, you can produce your own video clips, you can produce your own musical CDs. But most of the CDs and books that are produced now don't earn anything for their authors. Think of all those, those clips on YouTube. They don't earn anything for the authors because it's more and more difficult as the number of clips increases to get the world's attention. So what I want to do is to ask what are the psychological limits behind the world's attention constraint? Why can't we pay attention to all of those clips on YouTube at a time? It's not just time, it's also attention. So, what I want to do is to tell you really three things about the neuropsychology of attention scarcity. This is the answer to the question, where are the bottlenecks, the limits in our brain? Now, the first thing to know is that some channels by which we process information have much tighter constraints on the total bandwidth, the total amount of information that can pass through, than do other channels. At the start of this talk, I showed you a comparatively high capacity, high bandwidth channel. That was the part of your brain which is responsible for assessing faces. You can look at somebody's face and you can tell from the position of their eyes, from how they smile, and from many other things about their face, whether you are willing to trust them or not. I am doing some experiments with my colleagues in Toulouse, which I don't have time to tell you about now, but maybe we can discuss it in the questions, in which we show that people's ability to smile convincingly is an important task, an important ability that helps them to create economic trust. And smiling convincingly gives you an economic return. But as the picture showed you at the start of the talk, most of that is pre-conscious. Most of the things that we can work out about other people's faces happen not in our conscious attention, but in our pre-conscious attention. Our conscious attention is much more limited. And in particular, it's limited by what we call working memory. And working memory is the thing that you use when you try to remember somebody's telephone number. They tell you a telephone number, and roughly speaking, you can keep seven digits of that number in your working memory at the same time. You can train your memory a bit. You can maybe go up to nine digits, but that's about it. And many of our tasks in a modern digitalized economy use working memory, which is much more constrained than our ability to take in faces and other things. Now, the second thing I want to tell you is that our ability to pay conscious attention to the world around us is much more limited than we think. And in order to show you this, because I can tell you, but how do you know whether to believe me, I want to show you I'm going to um, run for you a very short YouTube clip. It lasts one and a half minutes, and I want you to pay very close attention to this. Okay, because what you're going to need to do is to count the number of times something happens. Okay, you're going to see a team of basketball players passing the ball to each other, and I want you to count how many times the ball is passed between players who are wearing white. 
Okay, so here is the clip. Pay very close attention, and at the end I will ask you how many times the ball was passed. So, how many people, how many people, and how many passes? 15. 15. Okay, uh, let's see what the true answer is. Correct answer is 15. Well done. Now the second question. How many people saw the gorilla? The rest of you didn't see the gorilla? That is about 20% of you saw the gorilla. Now, do the rest of you believe that there was a gorilla? You think, let me show you the gorilla. Okay, now watch slowly. Well, well, may I make you a, 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 a sincere recommendation? If you are ever witness to a crime and you have to give evidence in court, please do not tell the judge that you once watched a video with a gorilla in it who went like this and you didn't notice the gorilla, okay? The court would never trust you again. What does this show? It shows us that we are paying much less attention to the things going around us, on around us than we think we are. Attention is very scarce. And interestingly, and this is the third piece of neuroscience finding that I want to tell you about, the kind of attention that uses our working memory you know, the, the kind that, uses, that we need for memorizing phone numbers, is actually more easily distracted than the kind that processes images. Now, that might seem strange, because you might think that the rational thing to do, if you have a very scarce part of your brain capacity, is that you want to make it less distractible. But our brains don't work like that. Why? Because the same part of our brain that uses working memory also chooses how to allocate our attention between different tasks. So when we're doing things that are using our working memory intensively, we are even less well able than the rest of the time to choose how to allocate our attention according to its relative importance. So it's bad news really. It's those times when we most need our working memory that we're most unable to guarantee it free from interruption and uh, disturbance. And so what is the result? There's only so many things that we can do with our attention at any one time. And we are bad at screening out claims. Because we need the working memory to choose how to allocate our attention, but there's not enough of it because we are using our working memory for tasks that when we were evolving in Africa, we didn't need to do very much. Things like reading text on a screen, things like m making a telephone number, things like reading a book. And when we evolved in Africa, we allocated our scarce brain attention to the things that really mattered then, like looking at people's faces, and deciding whether we could trust them, but not for the things that didn't matter then, like reading books. So what's the result? We have this very scarce working memory attention, but it's being flooded all the time with advertising and spam and distraction and uh, 
what do we feel like? We feel that we can't, we are overwhelmed by distraction, but at the same time, we can't get the attention we feel we deserve from the people we want it from, from our bosses and our friends and our lovers and our customers and our, our, our children. We feel that somehow the ability to choose rationally between the claims on our attention is not working right. Now, if that's bad news, it's going to get worse because most types of internet search are going to involve more and more of these claims on scarce attention. Up to now, most kinds of matching have been what we call one-sided. So you want to find a firm that can sell you something. And you have to be very choosy about what kind of firm you look for, and the search engine can help you do that. But the firm doesn't have to be choosy about you. Uh, if you uh, uh, find the firm, they're pleased. They have more customers. But a lot of kinds of matching, which will be more important in the future, are what we call two-sided. So if I want to find somebody to go on a date, and I don't just want to get the person who matches my ideal characteristics, because the person who matches my ideal characteristics probably would like to match with somebody much better than me. So I have to do a difficult task. I have to find the person who has the best characteristics, but who also, amazingly, is interested in me. And that's really hard. That's a hard computer science problem. It's hard to write search algorithms that do that. And it's also a hard quality problem, because both of us have an incentive to lie about our characteristics. And as social networking expands, so Facebook and, and so on becomes more important, you're going to find that most search is not like tapping in a description of a firm that you want to sell your product. It's going to be about things like finding a professional partner who could work well with you, or finding a PhD supervisor who's interested in supervising you, or finding a date, or um, uh, finding people to work in your company who really like the kinds of things that your company does. And that's going to become more and more difficult search problem. So, what about the future? Well, I started by saying that in a world when not many people can write, the ability to write gives you a good job. Today, we're in a world in which not many people can program a computer even simply. The United States employed last year over three million computer professionals in many different sectors. It's difficult to compare that with the rest of the world because the statistics are not the same, but India employed 2.3 million people in its software industry. Now, not everybody who works in the software industry is a computer professional, and many computer professionals don't work in the software industry, but it shows that the US and India now have roughly the same numbers of software professionals. And pretty well anybody with a good IT training can get a job. But in the future, that may not be true anymore, because to get a job, you need a skill which is scarce. And there are two ways to do that. One is you undertake a training. And it's a training that, gives, that is not available to everybody. And so it gives you a, scare, a skill that not everybody has. Or the other thing is that you have a skill, but you exercise it with real creativity and with real charm. And you are better at doing it than the other people who can do it. Now, how can we tell whether IT training is going to be like the first thing? Is it going to be like reading that disappears, the, it's no longer scarce? Or is it going to be the kind of skill that people can exercise with creativity and charm? And I puzzled a long time over this to try and see how we could see what the future would look like. And then I had an idea. Um, in this graph, I'm going to show you, th these are some statistics from the United States Bureau of Labor Statistics, which show that some kinds of jobs differ from each other, not in that 
average or median earnings of the people in those jobs, but in how widely uh, unequal the uh, earnings are. So here are six jobs in the United States which earn the same median wage. So in, in measured in dollars per hour, it's about $24 per hour. But if you look at the, the steepest curve, those are film and video editors. If you look at the least steep curve, those are signal and tri track switch repairers. And in be between come uh, arbitrators, mediators, and conciliators, forensic science technicians, sorry, edit other editors, not film editors, forensic science technicians, and then dietitians and nutritionists. And what this is telling you roughly is that people who are repair signals and tracks have a skill which more or less everybody uses in a similar way. And so the best ones don't get paid much more than the least good ones. But film and video editors have a skill which can be exercised with much creativity. The best ones are very much in demand. And the best ones work with the best other professionals and they earn much, much more money. Now here's the question I asked myself. I wanted to know how is this distribution of earnings changing over time? In particular, in one of the industries that has been most affected by uh, technical change in recent years, which is the movie industry in the United States. So, here is a graph which I want to explain to you quite carefully. On the left hand side, the far left, you will see two pairs of uh, columns. And these are jobs that most people would agree are relatively low skill jobs and they have remained about the same as they were before. So um, the blue, the very far blue uh, column tells you how much the person in the 90th percentile earned as a multiple of the person in the 10th percentile. And it was just under two times. And there's, that's a, a, a parking lot at attendant. And in the blue is the data from the year 2000, and the red is the data from the year 2009. Here is a fast food chef, somebody in McDonald's. Okay, again, you can be, you know, the best fast food chefs are a little bit better than the not so good fast food chefs, but there's not a lot of difference. And sure enough, nothing's changed very much. You can look at some better paid occupations and ones with a bit more creativity, but that haven't changed very much. And so these are accountants, these are lawyers, they're actually paralegals because the lawyers, most lawyers won't release their earnings for these uh, statistics. And now here, in the middle of the diagram, is a set of occupations in the movie industry. And what I guessed was that some of the occupations in the movie industry have probably become less creative over time. So if you look at these ones here, you find broadcast technician, camera operator, and projectionist. And what do you see? They had quite high dispersion of earnings in 2000, but it's been going down. The earnings dispersion has become flatter. And that makes sense, because in the early days of uh, high-tech camera work, a camera was a complicated, difficult thing to operate, and the really good camera operators were worth a lot more than the not so good ones. But the technology's been making it easier. It's now much easier for people to learn how to be a pretty good camera operator. So the dispersion has been falling. Contrast that with film editors, actors, look at the huge, already huge dispersion of earnings of actors, and that's got even bigger. It's gone from over seven times to over nine times. And even makeup artists. If you're a creative makeup artist, you get hired with the best actors, you appear in the highest selling movies, and your life is very nice. A few little things here you might notice. Uh, models, their earnings have increased a bit more. You might be surprised that the dispersion is so small. You might say, well, we know Claudia Schiffer earns a huge amount of money, but remember, this measure 
is the comparison of the 90th percentile and the 10th percentile. Claudia Schiffer is not at the 90th percentile. She's not even at the 99th, not even the 99.9th. Most model, you can be very, very beautiful and you're still only earning quite a small wage. Um, here, rather sadly, is the profession of bailiffs. Uh, bailiffs are people who come and repossess your house if you can't pay the mortgage. And these people, sadly, have been getting more creative over time. Writers and authors, interestingly, on average, the creativity has been going down. Why? Because it's like models. The very best writers and authors, the one hundredth of one percent, earn huge amounts, but it's now easier to become a reasonable published author. It's much less expensive. You can publish your book even yourself. And now, this is what I wanted to show you. Here are two types of profession in the computer industry. Here are programmers, and here are people who work in computer support. Now, programmers have been becoming gradually more creative. Why? Because think of the kind of work they do. They write computer games. And to write a computer game, it's not enough just to be technically skilled. You have to be imaginative, inventive, creative. But here are the people, and there are many, many more of them, who work in IT support. And what do we see? The earnings of dispersion has been going down. Their work's become a bit less creative. It's become more routine. And relatively speaking, less well paid. So I've nearly finished. Um, what, what kind of conclusion can we draw from all this? Well, that very last pair of columns on the right-hand side of that graph in some sense warns you that computer skills, however much they may help the world to solve problems of poverty, may be a little bit like literacy skills, reading and writing, in the sense that some of the great benefits that they yield today to the few people who have them will no longer be so great in a world in which everybody has them. Um, in particular, some kinds of information technology skills offer diminished opportunities for creativity. And that has a possible worrying long-term implication. Many people who will pay for expensive education to get trained as IT literate people, but who find at the end that they can't get jobs or they can't get very creative jobs. In China, and particularly in India, there is another very worrying feature, which is that, as many of you know, selective abortion is meaning that the number of girl children who are being born is falling rapidly compared to the number of boy children. And it's likely that China will have, by the year 2030, something like 50 million men who will never find a wife. And the more of those who are uh, internet savvy and uh, can get online to express their frustrations and grievances, the more dangerous potentially that frustration will be. So I want to conclude not by saying that the benefits from ICT for development are illusory. They're not. They are wonderful. They are extraordinary. And in many areas like health and education, they are truly transforming the prospects for hundreds of millions of the world's most desperately poor people. But we have to keep a sense of perspective. They are not the magic bullet that will solve everything. And in particular, we cannot think that just giving computers to people is going to solve the difficulty for them of finding a livelihood. Because when everyone has a computer, then the person with the computer is no longer sure to be able to use that computer to get a job. And we will have to think much more creatively about how to include people in a sustainable world economy in the very long run, we cannot assume that information and, computer and communication technology will do that job for us. Thank you for listening to me. I look forward to your questions.
ringrazio Paul Seabright per aver messo duramente. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Seabright, for challenging so much what we have between our ears. And uh, even to the point that it's getting overheated. Uh, personally, I would have a number of questions, uh, but I want uh, to leave room to questions by the audience first and foremost. So the floor is open to any questions. Okay. Thank you for this very stimulating and very fun, indeed, uh, presentation. Yeah. Um, I just wonder about the last slide, um, about your conclusion about the, the, the dangers of having so many uh, men without women in India and China. And I don't really get the relationship uh, with uh, the ICT. I would rather think that uh, uh, after all, uh, uh, with ICT, those men could uh, maybe look for women elsewhere in the world and uh, to some extent uh, spread the problem uh, so that maybe other men in other parts of the world would, uh, would guess uh, at least uh, some part of the, say, incidence of this uh, uh, very bad problem. This is just, uh, so uh, could, could you explain it better? Thank you. Yes, th that's a very interesting question. Um, as I understand it, and I don't have hard evidence about this, but I uh, have seen some uh, intelligent journalistic reports, um, ICT is actually making the problem worse in China in particular because it is enabling um, young, attractive Chinese women to find partners overseas more easily than uh, young Chinese men. And uh, therefore, more Chinese women are linking up with foreign men than uh, Chinese men with foreign women. So that the, the immediate impact seems to me to worsen the, the problem. As far as the overall link with ICT is concerned, um, I wanted to use that as an example of a more general difficulty, which is that much of what we do, the most important things about our lives, and love and marriage is one important thing, but it's not the only one, depend not just on our own abilities, but also on the qualities of the people that we can match with. And people believe that the internet and telephony and so on makes us better able to find suitable matches. But the, what I wanted to point out is that not everybody can find the best match. And sometimes this improved communication technology increases the frustration because uh, imagine yourself in the position of a young Chinese man with uh, not very high earnings and you, know, you have maybe set your eyes on uh, you know, one of the nicest and most attractive uh, young women in your village and then you discover that she has met somebody on the internet and she has gone abroad. So, you know, it's, it, it's bad news for some when it's good, good news for others. I want to make a comment, maybe it won't be terribly realistic, uh, but perhaps it, um, it might also be applicable. And by the way, I thank you very much indeed for your presentation. That was fascinating. Um, now, since the whole universe is energy, uh, although I'm, of course, a Christian, I accept uh, what science has taught us about uh, the uh, origin of life. So we are part of that uh, energy. That's why I said that what I'm going to say may also be uh, unrealistic. Supposing that we survive uh, 
to the next uh, nuclear explosion or some other catastrophe, in some time from now, we we'll may be able to have uh, communication worldwide through uh, telematics, uh, information science, internet, and uh, perhaps in the future, uh, mobile phones may become uh, so small that we can even have them under our skins or whatever. So it may become possible to have a very quick communication uh, on a planet scale. Now, if that is the case, should that happen, can we uh, believe that uh, if we don't want to become mere robots, is there a chance that we can preserve uh, human relations, which is what can really save us and prevent us from becoming a mere uh, chunk of energy as all other beings in the universe. Thank you. Well, that is a, a cosmic question. <laughs> but I think I see a very serious point behind it, which is that um, for us to be completely transparent and available to the communications of others might seem like a more warm and human position situation to be in, but it would really be a nightmare. If your working memory, which was focusing on what you were hearing in the conversation from, say, your best friend, was constantly being interrupted by 350 other people who all want to talk to you at the same time, then you would not be able to pay attention to them and you would not be pay, able to pay attention to your friend. And a world in which we are no longer the masters of our own attention, in which our attention can be too easily distracted by others, would be no human world at all. Now, I don't think that's the way we are going to uh, develop. Um, but what is clearly true, what follows from what I have said to you about the findings in neuroscience is that we cannot stretch the capacity of our attention to handle competing claims on our attention much further than it already exists. What we need to do is to find more effective filters. And the filters are going to be the really interesting and difficult challenge. So, um, Think what happened when the first people began to browse on the internet and the first advertisers learned how to use a pop-up ad. You remember pop-up ads? The first pop-up ads were very effective, just as the first spam emails were very effective. And they worked because they were unfamiliar. And they allowed us to be distracted until we realized that we had to put good filters in place. Now, the best browsers control pop-up ads or allow you to control pop-up ads if you don't want them. The best email services control spam. There will be, I predict, the equivalent of very sophisticated email and spam filters and pop-up ad filters, but for a much wider range of things. So your Facebook page, if you have one, I don't, but um, if you have a Facebook page, you have a large number of people who are your friends, and it's much harder than it should be to control which of your friends gets which piece of information about you. You can control a bit, but um, if you think about how we actually behave as social animals, we filter things very carefully. I may go to lunch with you and tell you a piece of confidential information, which I wouldn't tell to somebody else. And that's a sign that you are my friend. And if I told everybody, then it would not be such a sign of our friendship that I could trust you with this 
information. So what I think we're going to see is that this first period of cheap communication in which anybody can try to get my scarce attention is going to seem like the time when the very first spam emails arrived before we had worked out how to manage this. In the future, I think, we will have very sophisticated software which limits quite severely the ability of other people to um, reach us and to distract us. And you may think that that's sad. You may think that psychologically we will be living inside gated mental communities. Maybe it's sad, maybe it's not, but it's inevitable. I'd like to ask you a question. I'd like to ask you a question uh, with regard to the last point you made. I remember when I was a university student that I learned that uh, when there's a scarcity of uh, something, that gets value. Although I know that now they sell uh, seawater in London at five pounds a bottle to enable the best restaurants to uh, cook fish. So uh, apparently things are changing there too. But um, we were spoken about things that are increasingly scarce, such as attention or memory. Can we expect to have the growth of a kind of economy of uh, memory, uh, giving a kind of commercial value to these things? The empire uh, created by Google and its income were, in fact, based on this. What they did is they selected uh, data which uh, the time and attention of people uh, that use the internet were not able to manage by themselves. So on the one hand, uh, the uh, spreading, the diffusion of uh, information may be uh, a challenge uh, to uh, an economy that is now based on it. Can we hypothesize that this growing need to filter, to select information will, in a way, create a new economy of attention and memory? That's a fascinating question. And the answer must be yes. But it's not easy to see exactly how this new economy will function. Let me give you an example. Many economists correctly believe that when a resource is scarce, the best thing to do is to give it an explicit price. So uh, when the Soviet economy collapsed, many goods which didn't have explicit prices were able to be priced more efficiently, and that was painful at first, but led to much more effective utilization of the scarce resources. Unfortunately, the economy of attention may not work very well with prices. Let me give you an example. If I am looking on the internet for somebody to have a date, uh, I mentioned that there's this problem of reciprocal attention, but it's not the only problem. Supposing that the best people, the people I would most like to have a date with, are very much in demand. I might send a message to somebody saying, I'd really like to go on a date with you. What would I conclude if she writes back to me and say, that would be a pleasure, my fee is $5,000. Now, that might be a market clearing price for her scarce time. And of course, in many, uh, in many contexts, um, if what I'm looking for is not a date, but is some professional exchange, if she's my lawyer, maybe $5,000 is the right price for her time, and maybe that's something that... But if it comes from somebody I want to have a date with, it's signaling something to me which isn't quite what I want. Okay. Now, what does that... Does that have wider implications? Yes, and let me give you a very good example. Many providers of... Uh, telephone and internet services are getting very excited about 
the potential for Facebook to allow them to uh, make services available to Facebook users using targeting. So if your friends all like the same restaurant as you, then this makes you more willing to go to the restaurant and much future advertising will be based around your Facebook networks. But some of these providers are hoping that they can use the old principles of pyramid selling to help them. So your friends will be offered a small amount of money if they can persuade you to go to uh, the restaurant with them. And if they can persuade you to buy a CD. And if they can persuade you to shop at the shop where you, uh, the advertiser has decided to. Now, think about this. Do you really want to feel that when you talk to your friends on Facebook and you discuss the things that you care about and the movies that you like, and the, do you want to feel that they're telling you what they're telling you because an advertiser has paid them? I think not. And I think most of us have an idea of a world in which prices are important because we are dealing with strangers, essentially, and a world in which prices don't matter because there is an exchange of something that is a signal about who we are, about our identity. Now, don't misunderstand me. I, I'm, I'm in favor of prices. I'm an economist. I think prices work pretty well in most circumstances. But in this two-sided search world where we are looking for connections, for communities, for friendships, for loyalty, prices will not be the way in which our scarce attention is allocated and we will have to find more creative and original ways to do that. Non so se, sì, prego. Vorrei tornare nella slide finale dove lei ci ha In your last uh, slide um, you showed us uh, the uh, wage uh, spread in, in different uh, uh, types of activity. One example um, is often that one, one can often claim that uh, an electronic engineer and a plumber are different uh, because the, the one thing is the difference in muscle power and one thing is the difference between brain uh, capability. But today there's uh, less and less space for the less gifted. So market economy was a way also to help the less gifted find their space. If that was the case, uh, what can be the way, in your opinion, to enable the less gifted in terms of cre creativity to find a, a job? Um, that's a question that it would take more than one extra lecture to answer properly. Um, I think we have some parts of an answer, but we do not have enough. Um, one important uh, thing that we must do is to think, is to plan our educational systems uh, for creativity and not just for skills. Um, politicians like to say, you know, we have to have an education system that gives people the skills they need. But what I've suggested is that a skill which seems valuable today may only have its value because it's scarce and when lots of people have it it may no longer be so valuable. But creativity can be taught. Um, creativity uh, has some innate elements, but it can be encouraged and it can be made to grow. And, uh, for example, I, I have seen interesting differences in international schooling systems because I've lived in both the uh, UK and France, and I've noticed very different styles of teaching of, as my children have moved through the uh, education systems in both of these countries. Um, roughly speaking, the French system puts more emphasis on skills, and some of them very good ones. Um, the uh, British system puts more on creativity, project work, teamwork. Um, 
and both have weaknesses. The, the British system is bad at skills. Uh, the French system is bad at creativity. Um, but I think we have to find ways in the education system to encourage both. We also need to remember that um, there will be a need for social protection and insurance, whatever happens, however well-skilled the workforce is in our countries, um, there will always be some people in those uh, workforces who have good skills but whose skills do not today bring them uh, work. And we will have to treat uh, social protection as something which, uh, uh, which is inevitable, which will not disappear, um, and which brings responsibilities. I have no difficulty with the idea that uh, if somebody is paid by the state to, uh, instead of working, that they may need to do other things in return for that. But the fact that your skills have not brought you a job should not be thought of as a uh, matter of shame. It should be thought of as one of the consequences which will continue for as long as uh, the social market economy continues. Uh, of the fact that when you undertake your education, you do not always know what opportunities you are going to be able to use that education for. So, I'm sorry, it's not a very, um, it's, it's not a very complete answer, but it's at least some of the uh, elements of the answer to your very interesting and difficult question. Bene, non l'ho detto prima, ma credo che questa possa essere la nostra ultima domanda, eh, anche per lasciare a Polsi Bra and I think that we're going to take just one last question, so as uh, to leave some time to Professor Paul Seabright, some time to have lunch, so I'm afraid this, is, uh, this was the last question. Thank you very much to you all.